Penguin Random House Audio presents The Lady's Handbook for Her Mysterious Illness, a memoir by Sarah Ramey. Read for you by Eileen Stevens, with several chapters read by the author. For my mother and father. Part 1. Chapter 1. Dear listener, there may exist a graceful and elegant way to begin one's gynecologic and colorectal memoir, but it never does spring to mind. Let us start then with a story. We can travel back to where it all began and for a moment leave the particulars behind. That sounds much nicer, lovely even, considering it all began so many years ago with a cool, luxuriant swim in Walden Pond. I remember it well. The heat was heavy. I was a summer student at Harvard with no air conditioning, and Walden beckoned for the reasons it always will. Though I suppose the busloads of tourists beached on the imported sand should have sounded some instinctive alarm when I arrived, they didn't. I walked right on past and made my way to the side of the pond where the water was still and the snorkelers out of sight. I remember walking into the water. I remember floating on my back. I remember the coolness and the peace and the poetry of the place, and I remember feeling like I couldn't ask for anything more. The next day, in the emergency room, I had quite forgotten all of that. A urinary tract infection, known as a UTI, is a very painful but easily treatable infection of the urethra. Most people describe it as peeing broken glass, and I would have to agree with most people. But my ER doctors patted me on the back as they ordered up the standard antibiotics and I bounded off to the pharmacy, clutching my prescription, counting the minutes in the 24 hours they told me it would take to go away. 56 hours later, I was back in the emergency room. It had not gone away. In fact, it did not go away for six months. How strange, the college physician said as he took my history. I had never been sexually active, which made things particularly challenging, both diagnostically and emotionally. I was a senior in college and it was my time. I even had the right person picked out. But the UTI stayed. We joked and called it my pooty, or permanent UTI, and I laughed along with the rest. But in private, in the bathroom, I was profoundly unamused. This prologue is typical of women like me. A simple and innocuous medical event, often with a gyno or gastro tilt, that should have resolved simply, but didn't. She thinks it is just another one of life's ups and downs, when in fact, up is about to become a distant memory. There is a secret society of sorts that no one, not even the members, has heard of. We don't look alike, we don't dress alike, and we're from all over. There is no secret handshake, no meeting place, no cipher. We are the women with mysterious illnesses, and we are everywhere. When I went home for Christmas, just outside of Washington, D.C., my parents, who are both top-notch physicians, made an appointment for me to see Washington's preeminent top-notch urologist. Dr. Damascus said I seemed like a nice, normal young woman who would probably like to get back to the business of being able to pee and have sex freely, and he saw no reason why he couldn't make that happen. He determined I no longer had an active infection, and then proposed a procedure to be done right there that day in the office. As he described it, he would insert a small instrument into the urethra, rip it, and this would solve the problem. I frowned. But Dr. Damascus assured me it was the only option should I want a normal life again. The gentle ripping, he explained, was more of a, a light stretching of the tissue and it would interrupt the muscle spasm and break the cycle of pain. He handed me a paper gown. I'm almost nostalgic for my naivete. I took the gown, steeled my nerves, saddled up, and put my feet in the stirrups. The procedure began benignly enough with a small swabbing of topical lidocaine, but in the next step, a device not unlike a very small car jack was inserted in the urethra and then ratcheted out several notches until the urethra, as promised, tore. It was a blinding pain that no amount of lidocaine would dull. 
He peeked over the paper blanket and asked if I thought he had gone enough notches. I was crying too hard to do anything but nod. He went one more notch. Dear patient listener, I have not forgotten about you or our purpose here, or the cautionary voice in the back of my head whispering something about too much information. But I think this history is important. So before we move out of this reverie, let me come quickly to the end of the beginning of our story. That night, after Dr. Damascus sent me hobbling back on my way, intuition's warning bell finally took up its low, steady thrum. I sat silently through dinner and put myself to sleep early. Something was not right. Something flu-like but menacing was starting to bristle. Everything hurt, not just my urethra. My ears hurt. My teeth hurt. I fell asleep, my hands clenching and unclenching of their own accord. When I woke, I was on the floor, quaking with rigors, drenched in sweat, and making a very bad noise. My mother was calling the hospital and dragging me toward the car. It appeared I'd become septic, an infection of the bloodstream that would have ended badly if my mother weren't such a top-notch physician. We were at the hospital in minutes. I was not witness to the miraculous save, but I heard all about it when I woke up. Top-shelf, nuclear-grade antibiotics pumped into me by the gallon, and it seemed like every doctor at Sibley Memorial Hospital came to sit by my side, making sure the doctor's daughter pulled through. I was extremely well taken care of. I was going to live. It would be all right. By the next day, everyone had gone back to their private practices, wishing me well, which I very much appreciated. The only problem was, and I hated to be a stickler, I wasn't all right. I was still aching all over, badly, even though the infection was gone. I had a fever every afternoon and intense pain all down my legs. The broken glass pain was starting to radiate out to the surrounding muscles in the vagina, rectum, and bladder. My bowels seized up and stopped working. I itched. Strange, my doctors murmured, making notes. How very strange. They ran dozens of tests, but everything came back negative. At a loss, and at my insistence, they sent me back to school with painkillers and portable IV antibiotics. They said it would slowly all start to get better, and I believed it. When had my body ever done anything but get all better? I was ready to get back to the business of peeing and expressing my sexuality freely. I would carry my little IV from class to class if that's what it took. But my body did not get better. Class after feverish class, Night after achy night, and morning after urethrally excruciating morning, I could not deny it was getting much worse. And in the most mysterious ways. I was on so many medications and getting sick so fast, it was like a